wide reaching. Uh, we are looking to reach everyone in the state um, and uh, our, our urban, rural, underserved areas, underserved groups. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the word out on this. And uh, this has been an interesting first week. We're really happy with the kickoff of this. Uh, this is our first office hour section, so we'll go through what we're hoping to accomplish today. Uh, but just a little background on the uh, boot camp. Um, we really uh, created the idea about a week ago. Uh, we re um, stood this up on Monday for our first boot camp. Uh, we had great topics this week on PPP, alternative funding sources, and, and starting up relationships with your banks. Um, next week, we have some great topics that we'll go through. Um, we'll be running this uh, currently for six weeks, uh, every day, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be getting the word out through social and our links, as well as uh, sending out emails to everybody. Um, for next week, um, exciting topics. Monday, we're going to do, again, alternative sources of funding. Uh, we'll review very quickly PPP and idle issues. These questions can always be asked during our uh, daily touch points. So, uh, that'll kind of continue on until we um, exhaust all avenues on the PPP and IDLE, but we will also look at alternatives. And these alternatives are extremely important as we start to move forward. We're also having guest speakers come in to discuss negotiating relief, uh, working with landlords, utility providers, and others. And then on Wednesday, we're going to start in fundamentals of cost cutting and managing cash flow. Uh, we'll continue on that topic for um, a little while as well. And then as we move along, we're going to start into uh, our returning strong um, concepts. And these will be uh, general throughout all small businesses, as well as getting into specifics for each industry group. Um, on Thursdays and Fridays every week, we will have open Q&A guidance advisors available from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. This is our first launch of that. Uh, so if you understand the concepts that we're trying to do is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, new topics, Thursday, Friday, reviewing and asking Q&A. So that's what we'll do today. Um, today, we're really, really fortunate to have uh, five great individuals uh, joining us. Bennett Brown from Thunderbird Corporate Finance, uh, Carrie Ann Todd from Beach Fleshman, and Caitlin uh, Lane from Silverhawk Financial, Thomas Barr from First Arizona, I'm sorry, Local First Arizona. Thank you, Thomas. And we have Joy Cervantes. So with that, um, if you're not familiar with uh, Zoom, we have a Q&A uh, screen that you can access, or uh, our group is not in entirely large today, so you can just unmute and uh, or actually uh, raise your hand and I will unmute everybody. We can uh, ask questions as we go. So when we start up, uh, let me just look at this really quick. Uh, Mark, I can't get my Q&A to go here, one second. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, so let me go to the attendees. I'm actually going to um, allow everyone to talk uh, on the attendee side. Mark, if you can help me with that, I think we want to get that unmuted. Thank you. All right. So let's go ahead and see if there's any questions for the uh, group. And while we're waiting for that, um, let's ask uh, Robert, if you could just give us a quick update on, um, you had sent out information which I thought was extremely useful on PPP. Do you mind giving us a, a quick review of the current numbers on PPP and any updates in that regard? Yeah, I'm going to pull up my email here real quick that I've got uh, with that information. Um, total PPP loans approved as of yesterday afternoon, missing information from the SBA, was $90 billion um, with over 960,000 loans approved from 55,300 lenders participating. Um, the groups that are leading that is small banks, the under $10 billion asset banks are leading the way in the number of loans and dollars um, with about 61% of the loan volume through those banks and 43 billion in loans. Um, the medium banks are coming in, in second with the, the number of loans uh, with 206,000 loans and large banks have done 167,000 loans. 
Um, so as of, as of yesterday afternoon, we were again at, um, at about 90 billion spent of the 310. So uh, there is still some room. Um, and it looks like the small, smaller banks, local banks are doing a large part of that volume and getting those processed and through. Thank you. Um, for any of the panelists, do you want to give your um, uh, perspective on the PPP side or any other uh, areas around PPP or idle for the team? I'm happy to, Andy. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, um, so there's uh, been a lot of reporting coming in from small businesses um, stating that they are uh, receiving their advanced direct deposits for their idle applications uh, that have been put in. Um, we're seeing around a 28 day to 35 day turnaround response um, from the SBA, depending on when you applied. Um, so if you've applied after April 2nd, I would say um, you should start to either see your loan being processed or potentially a direct deposit to your business account for any of the cash advance for the idle loans. And if you haven't heard back, um, I, I would say just sit tight and wait if you're still in the queue and, and have applied after April 2nd. Um, for the PPP, we got great word yesterday. So they actually um, held off the big banks from um, processing their um, loan applications for eight hours yesterday to leave room for the smaller and mid-sized banks to get them through. And so we saw local institutions like Arizona Federal Credit Union were able to get uh, 200 loans processed just yesterday based off of them opening it up like that. Um, so we are seeing a lot of small businesses get support in Arizona this time based off of some of those um, adaptations that the SBA has made for this second round of PPP funding. Excellent, that's great information. So. Um, it sounds to me, if you have not applied as a small business, you should still work to apply either way, um, even for this round or not. I don't have any inside information on what Congress will do or any other legislation at this point, but um, if by chance there is another round, this first in first out application process is super important to be uh, logged into if you are looking to get a loan. Bennett, give us an overview about what you're doing and uh, what you're seeing with your companies uh, that you've been doing uh, work with. Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. So um, I've worked with um, uh, several businesses and have been directing them to what I would call the small to mid-sized business banks. Um, and, uh, and typically it was uh, businesses whose PPP loan ranged anywhere from 75,000 to 500,000 and getting them to a smaller mid-sized bank uh, certainly enabled them to communicate directly with the underwriters. So if if people aren't that familiar with the, the banking process, uh, basically they capture the information, make sure everything is correct, and then upload it into the SBA system. And in the SBA world, there's what's called preferred SBA lenders who kind of have a direct uh, uh, pipeline, so to say, to upload SBA applications. And so one of the things that I was uh, focusing on when I was working with businesses to uh, apply for the PPP loan was to get them to a, uh, a small to mid-sized bank. Typically, um, some of them were local, some of them were national, but to make sure that that bank was a preferred lender with the SBA so that they could upload that uh, application very quickly. And, uh, and then, of course, staying on top of the, uh, the bank and the business development or um, representative at the bank that we were working with to make sure, hey, do you have everything that you need? Is there anything missing that is keeping you from uploading this uh, application? And, uh, and really just staying on top of that. So... What I've seen is that once the application is submitted to the SBA, typically 
within 48 hours, uh, plus or minus, an SBA number comes back. And then the regulation from the SBA and from the Treasury, et cetera, is that once a bank has the SBA number for a business, they have to uh, create the loan document and fund that loan within 10, uh, I think it's calendar days, not business days, but within 10 calendar days. And so what I'm seeing from uh, the loan documentation is that uh, some of the banks are using a standard loan, a loan document uh, that's coming from the SBA. Other banks are creating their own loan document. And, uh, and again, getting the loan document signed and money funded within that 10 day window. Uh, so that's kind of what I've been seeing. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're gonna have some programs that talk about the uh, uh, post funding and tracking of uh, the expenses associated with the PPP to ensure uh, the loan forgiveness at the end of eight weeks. Uh, and, and that I'm sure that's going to be a great, well-attended uh, uh, program that you guys will put on. Yep, that's a great point. The eight-week um, spending and expense uh, calculations to apply for forgiveness is going to be a very important topic um, as we start to move forward. In fact, um, as we look for suggestions for next topics, um, would be very timely to discuss that in some of our communications next week, as well as the following week. Bennett, do you have a feel for percentage success rate uh, with applications uh, versus funding events? Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, quite honestly, um, there's a very little underwriting done on the bank level. So, you know, typically with bank loans and particularly SBA loans, uh, pre all of this uh, uh, coronavirus stuff, uh, banks would do, you know, heavy due diligence, um, uh, looking at the numbers, looking at the financials. And this is really um, more the bank gathering the information, doing a cursory due diligence. Um, and a lot of bankers I talked to have confirmed from the SBA and from the Treasury that the bank is not liable for any incorrect information coming from the borrower. <clears throat> uh, the banks wanted to make sure that they didn't, were not held liable for uh, putting in incorrect information coming from a borrower, and they're not. Uh, the borrower is attesting to you know, all of the information provided. So as long as a company provides, you know, that payroll information, health insurance information, it's a pretty straightforward two-page application. And so as long as they have all of that, I think where, where I've seen some challenges uh, with banks and submitting is um, where a company is owned by multiple individuals. Uh, I've had a couple of cases where maybe it's a software technology company or medical device company with maybe 50 different owners uh, with maybe two or three percent and no one owes, owns more than 20 percent of the company. So how do you fill out that kind of an application? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, so, but uh, I would say that, you know, it's a very high percentage once you get the proper information to the bank uh, and, of course, them uploading it in a, in a timely fashion. And, and again, that comes to working with the small to mid-sized business banks. Thanks, Bennett. I'm going to go to a question uh, that we have. I'm going to um, a hand raise. Uh, Ron, it, Erman, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Um. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I was successful with uh, the application for the PPP and I received my funds. However, I'm having a terrible time with the idle loan. Um, I tried once it was still open, but my time overlaps and it kicked me out when I was almost done. And uh, now 
it's only going through the SBA from what I, I was told and I understand. And when I go on their website, from what I understand, it's not longer available. Well, let's address that. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, Caitlin, could you take that question and then we'll ask our other uh, uh, expert panelists to um, add on to any comments. Caitlin, we can't hear you. Um, sorry about that. Um, what, uh, do, does anyone want to cover IDLE, Robert? Yeah, I'll cover that. And Thank you. This is Robert. Um, so the, the IDLE loan program, um, has, the portal is not reopened with the additional funding. Uh, from our understanding is the SBA is working through their current list of applicants um, because their application load was so big that they weren't able to fund all the applicants with the first round of funding that they had. Um, and that's why the portal is not reopened to apply. Um, so if you did get an application in for the IDLE loan, um, hopefully they're working through it. If you need to find out where you stand, you can call their customer service number and I'll post that number in the chat. Um, but uh, I, I constantly check every day to see when they, they reopen it. And once they reopen it, we'll uh, definitely make it known um, through our sources. Uh, I don't think I got through. Um, it kicked me out right before I got the number. So I really honestly don't think I even got through. And getting to their phone number, I mean, forget it. I was on hold for hours and just that it won't get you anywhere. So I was wondering if you know for sure if they're going to reopen it for applications. So I'll make sure I'll be there on between the first few. Um, we do not know at this time if they're going to reopen okay. it or when they're going to reopen it. Yeah, okay. I, can, I can jump in too. I apologize. I think my computer froze on me. But um, Rumi, I think the thing we're all looking for, and hopefully you can all hear me okay, is we're checking it daily. The funds from the second wave of funding are expected to go to help the um, economic injury disaster loan. We just don't know when those funds will arrive and when they'll, they'll reopen the application process. But we do anticipate that to happen. But again, at this point, nobody really knows for sure. I would just continue to the website and continue to try to get your application in so you're first in line um, if and when those funds do become available again. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay. Um, also, tomorrow we're gonna have office hours again to answer questions. Uh, Robert, why don't we go ahead and um, update everyone uh, tomorrow morning again on IDLE and see what activities we had. I also see in the chat, uh, actually the Q&A section, um, it was an anonymous attendee. Uh, if you can chat or post your email address, we'll make sure you're on our email list uh, to get our distribution as well. Um, otherwise, you can go to azcommerce.com and go to the COVID response small business and you'll see that. And thanks, Christine, we've got that. We'll log that in. Um, Robert and Mark will grab that so we can send you that information out. Um, I, uh, I did want to loop back really quick because I think Bennett made a really important point that um, the onus is going to be on the business owner around how they use the PP funds. And I think Carrie Ann could probably speak to this a little bit more in depthly than I, but what I'm encouraging my business owners to do as a best practice is to open up a separate bank account just for the PPP funds to make it really easy to track where and when they spend those monies. So um, I just wanted to make sure as these monies are starting to hit bank accounts, we're just thinking through that because um, it's a lot easier to handle up front than to try to go back and, and do an, a self audit, if you will. Yeah, great, Caitlin. Uh, Carrie Ann, if you could, why don't you walk us through some information, um, both in general on what you're seeing out there. Uh, it could be across PPP and idle. And then I know you have some expertise on the expense side of the eight weeks uh, forgiveness side. You're on mute, Carrie Ann. You're still on mute, sorry, let me see if we can unmute that. There you go. Does that work? Can yes. you hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. Um, I guess to piggyback off of what Caitlin said, you know, a follow-up question I've received on, well, if I open a new bank account, does that mean I have to write all the checks for all of my expenses out of that bank account? And I don't think that's the answer because 
um, I think the separate bank account is necessary, but then you can just transfer money from that separate bank account to your checking or to your payroll account or wherever it is you're spending those funds. Because I kind of see if it, it could be a logistical nightmare is if, you know, you use a payroll company and you already have them set up the EFT out of your payroll account, trying to get them to EFT out of this special account for eight weeks. I could just see that being a hot mess and your employees not getting paid. Um, so I think it's okay to keep functioning as a business using your regular checking and your regular payroll checking account, um, but kind of keep that money set aside like in a, as in a savings account and then transfer it over as you use it. I think that's a, that makes it easier than having to try to move all your operations to this other account. Um, yeah, we've seen a big switch in um, the questions posed to our firm from how do I get a loan, which was, you know, hot and heavy from March 27th when the CARES Act opened up until the first day that loans were being processed. And just in the last three days, the switch has really been to um, forgiveness and how do people ramp up for that and um, what they need to do. And and I don't want to steal the thunder of any special session you're going to have on that because I think, I mean, I could spend 90 minutes just talking about forgiveness because it's so technical. Um, so just kind of as a overview, I guess, going into it, if you just got your PPP loan, I think you really need to sit down and figure out what are the costs that are eligible and looking at what those costs are for your business when those costs normally occur, you know, how frequently do you pay rent? When is your next rent payment due? How frequently do you pay your utilities? What all of the utilities you have that are going to be eligible in the forgiveness calculation? Um, what interest, what loans do you have that qualify that you can capture the interest portion? It's not the principal portion, just the interest portion. Um, and then looking at all your payroll costs and projecting out, okay, what, how often do I make payroll? every Friday, or maybe I'm bi-weekly, and looking at what is my normal payroll cost, where am I at, and project out eight weeks of expenses, and look at where you might be in eight weeks from now. And from that, look at what the components are. How much was I able to spend on payroll? If your goal is 100% forgiveness, you need to be spending 75% of your proceeds on payroll costs. And those payroll costs are the same payroll costs that you captured when you were applying for the loan in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if you remember when you were doing your application, you captured your gross wages, your, sorry about that, I can't get my phone to stop ringing. Um, you captured your gross payroll costs, your health insurance, your retirement, all of those same costs now qualify on the back end when you're claiming forgiveness. And so if you can project out all of those costs and see where you're going to be at and see if ultimately you want 100% forgiveness, if you either need to do some rehiring, if you've laid some people off in the last three or four weeks, um, if you've made any changes to wages, if you've lowered people's salaries or if you've lowered their hourly rate, do you need to continue to do that or what the intent of the PPP is that you bring them back to normal, right? That you bring everyone back to their normal pay, whatever that was, when we were normal, whenever that was. Um, and that's the intent of the PPP is to help you make normal payroll for your normal employees. And so if you project that out, you can get a sense of where you're going to be and then maybe make some decisions as you go along the eight-week process um, to business decisions you might need to adjust to get to where you want to be. Yeah, it makes sense to start that planning as soon as you can so you can understand where you're going to end up at the end of it. I, I think that's a very good point. Thank you, uh, Carrie Ann. Joy, um, question to you. Um, just first of all, uh, what are you seeing out there? And if you can give us some insights on some of the teams that you're working with um, and what your organization is uh, engaged in. Thanks. Oops, sorry, Joy, we don't have audio on you. Uh, it looks like you're unmuted too, so there might be an audio problem. Unless somebody else can hear, I cannot hear. Okay. No, I cannot hear her either. Okay. 
All right. Um, so I'm going to leave this for a last round. I, I don't have any other uh, questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, if you do, just uh, please unmute and uh, or raise your hand. We'll unmute you. Any other comments from our um, advisory team? I'd like to uh, see if there's any closing thoughts. Yeah, I think one thought I wanted to have is, you know, business owners are put in a position to have to make decisions very quickly, right? And then that's the whole conundrum. And a lot of business owners are deciding on whether or not to apply on the forgivable notion on, well, I don't want to apply if it's not going to be truly forgivable. And I, I would almost encourage people to think about that as a secondary thought. You know, I think it's pretty clear we are in a recession. It's just a matter of how long this is going to last. And in any recession, cash is king. So the best advice I can give to business owners is you need to put yourself in a cash strong position and access as many funds available to you as possible. And, you know, we'll figure out down the road what that means as more information comes in but you know especially when you have the SBA ringing the bell that say hey this is a first come first serve type of loan you know it's almost a no-brainer to get in especially given the forgivable option that could apply depending on how you use those funds and how you track using those funds um, which you know I'm partnering with business owners CPAs to ensure that we do that so you know and the other piece is a line of credit you know, if it's taking 28 days for the PPP to go through, then a line of credit that you can get approved in two to three days can be a really great bridge loan in the meantime. So those are the two closing thoughts that I wanted to just encourage people to think about um, with regards to the PPP program. That's a super point. I'd like to um, plus one that. I mean, if you're a small business and you're not sure if you want to take the loan, uh, you can always take the loan. I don't think there's any prepayment penalties on this or payoff penalties. So you can preserve that loan in an account, not use it if you, do, if you choose not to, uh, but it would be there for you if needed. And then doing some of the tactics that, um, you know, Carrie Ann and others have spoke about, you can start to track what that forgiveness portion of it would be. And quite frankly, it could end up being a very good thing to have that as uh, emergency funds in cash, and then of course the other idea of just applying for alternative funding sources on a line of credit. Again, in the need, in, in the aspect that you may need it from a cash perspective going forward, but don't see yet the usage of fund. It's always uh, wise in these types of situations to have that option as you mm -hmm. start to move forward. And usually the time to do that is not when it's an emergency when you need it. It's much better to do it. Um, earlier in that process when you're in a position of not necessarily needing it, but doing it more as a backstop or some um, contingency. So it could work out really well if you, if you thought through it that way. Yeah, Andy, uh, I've communicated to uh, people that I'm working with, uh, some of them who didn't feel immediate impact in the economic, uh, current economic conditions but they felt in a month or so down the road they would. And so I communicated just that to them to apply, get the loan, go through the eight week period. And if 50% of the loan is uh, forgiven, and then you owe 50% of the loan, you could look at that in two different ways or several different ways. One being, hey, if I've segregated this money, as we had talked about, put it in a separate bank account, uh, I could just pay that back to the bank, the government. There is no, you're right, there is no prepayment penalty. So I could pay that money back. Or I could look at this as a 1% interest loan yep. that I'm going to pay back over the next uh 24 months minus the eight weeks that I've already been through or, you know, so now it's a 22 month instead of a 24 month payback, it's a 22 month payback on a 1% loan. And most of the banks that I've talked to, uh, the way they're looking at that, let's say you owe 50% uh, of whatever you receive, let's say you received 100,000, 50,000 is forgiven. 50,000 is then owed back over the next 22 months. They put that on a 22 month amortization uh, at 1%. And uh, that's a uh, not a bad, 
interest rate loan to be able to use that money to help your business uh, restart and kick back into uh, uh, generating revenue. Yeah, that that just brings up another great point around this that we don't talk about a lot. Um, but the concept of cost of capital and you know, having a very low interest rate loan and the usage of that capital and how you would be disciplined on how to pay that back could be a very good strategy moving forward. Um, but also the contingency side of that is super important as well. Um, just in case in one month from now things change, uh, you know, one way or the other, you'll have that ability to have some flexibility. So. Um, there was a question up there. I wanted to answer it. Just went away. Um, sure. sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. Sorry. Uh, one. What do you anticipate it will be after the eight weeks to proof? I mean, is it going to be just the nine forty one? There's going to be a lot more. Or what, how difficult is that going to be to approve that we use the funds in the way that they were supposed to? I'll leave that for anybody uh, on the team. What do we expect okay, so, um, to be? Thank you, Karina. Yeah. So I think the, what, the best way to explain it is document your spending as if you're expecting the IRS to come audit you. Um, and, I, and I use that because not that the IRS is always scary, but sometimes they are. And, you know, if you do get IRS audited on your tax return, the expectation is you're going to be able to justify and support with paper every expenditure and every revenue item. And I think that's the right attitude to take into this forgiveness computation is that while the lender who's going to review and approve or deny your forgiveness application may not audit it, use the word audit, because um, that's not really their responsibility under the CARES Act, um, I think that's the best way to do it. So if you're going to claim an expense for a utility, you should have a support that utility bill. And in addition to the utility bill, either the canceled check or the proof on your bank statement or the EFT where the money actually left your account. Because um, everything I'm reading is saying, you know, you need to justify every penny and you got to have it documented and just assume that you're going to be audited. And that would, and I think you'd be okay. Okay. Great. Easy enough. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question I wanted to answer. Uh, I thought I saw it from Leslie. So uh, the question was around the um, uh, self-employed, I believe it was. Um, it, it, I'm assuming that's the correct question. Um, do you guys have insights on that? I know that it's been a little tricky, the interpretation of applying for PPP as self-employed. Um, maybe we can cover a little bit of that now. Yes. Yeah, so um, Andy, uh, I've talked with a couple of bankers in regards to uh, and have processed a couple of uh, PPP applications for self-employed individuals. And uh, so from a self-employed individual standpoint, uh, what the banks are requiring, what the application process is requiring is uh, Schedule C. So a self-employed individual will file a Schedule C on their tax return. Uh, and I believe it's line 31 of the Schedule C, which is net income for that self-employed person. Uh, so uh, the calculation for how much a self-employed person would receive in a PPP loan is if they haven't filed their 2019 tax return, what they have to do is they have to provide a draft, quote unquote draft, of what their 2019 Schedule C is going to look like. It should be pretty close to what it actually is when they file their tax return. So then you go down to line 31, you divide that by 12, multiply that by two and a half, and that becomes your, um, uh, that because well, you multiply that by two and a half, and then you can uh, take so a self employed individual would pay their own insurance, health insurance. So you can then take, uh, you know, your monthly health insurance cost and adding that to the, uh, the multiple also. Uh, and that is the amount that you would apply 
for with the PPP program. Uh, and, uh, and again, I've done a couple of those with uh, different banks and uh, from backup perspective, there is no 941, there is no payroll documentation, uh, but what you're providing for that bank and for the uh, application process is the uh, draft or the actual 2019 Schedule C. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, I think in addition to that information, Robert posted a little bit of the, um, the Treasury view of that as well. So great. Um, Leslie, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you, Bennett. Uh, any final uh, questions or comments from our panelists? I, I would just say one comment on the sole prop, folks, is, you know, you have to have been profitable. And a lot of people have a lot of deductions, especially in the first couple years of, of their business when they have a lot more startup costs. So for folks that aren't profitable, that don't have enough, that have a zero in that line 31, you're not going to necessarily have be able to apply for the PPP potentially. So that's been a real issue of these kind of outliers that kind of get stuck in the middle, right? Where we have all this aid for folks and they're one category that don't, don't qualify. And so self-employed people can now qualify for unemployment under the CARES Act. And so you have to prove that you're searching for unemployment. And so that was one thing that I want to remind people of saying, hey, if you're really struggling right now as a self-employed person, um, unemployment is, is a potential option for you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Great. Excellent. Um, any other uh, last moment uh, comments or questions from our panelists or attendees? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I want to uh, really applaud everyone for their uh, detailed information. This is uh, excellent insights. Um, especially on the, you know, next steps of our eight week uh, process on the expense side. Uh, some of the insights, Bennett, that was provided on successes, as well as the, um, we get the uh, independent contractor self-employed question so much. So that was extremely helpful. Um, well, I really appreciate everyone's uh, time today and thank you for attending. We're going to go ahead and kick off again at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, we promise to, uh, send out our emails to make sure that there's a wide understanding of our office hours and we'll see that uh, I'm sure start to fill up as we move forward. So thank you so much, everyone on behalf of the Arizona Commerce Authority and uh, thank you again to our partners, uh, you're fantastic. Uh, for our small businesses, uh, keep working hard and hang in there, you have support from us uh, and we're gonna be doing everything we can for you to uh, return stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ronit. Thank you, guys. Great job. Great. Hey, Mark. Yes, Randy, hello. Hi. No, I just noticed you on there. I'm doing other stuff in the background. How, how many ended up attending? Uh, we had, I think 15 was the max. 15 total, but that includes all of us too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I see where the link is working, where it goes to both office hours, I guess, each week. 
Uh, I think that's just for this week. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure because I hadn't seen the link, but then I saw Andy's email as well that an email that maybe didn't go out. It did not. Okay. Uh, all right, gonna jump. Thanks, Randy. Yep, I'll see you in the next meeting.